The title of the uh, talk tonight is Human Rights in Central America, but because I'm not really an expert on either human rights or Central America, I'm going to limit it to something I really know about, which is Nicaragua. And I did some work trying to understand what the human rights issues were in terms of the usual language of human rights. And so that's what I'm going to talk about. In order to, I'd like to start with a story, but in order to, to understand this story, you need to know a little bit about what it was like under the Somoza regime before 1979, uh, the Somoza dictatorship, to live in Nicaragua and to uh, have a different point of view than the official point of view, to be in the opposition. And I'm going to quote a couple of shocking things. I apologize for how shocking they are, but just so you can get a feeling for what my starting point is, which is a story uh, about the day that the revolution was won. This is a quote from a book called Human Rights in Nicaragua Yesterday and Today <coughs> is compiled by the International Commission of Jurists in 1980 and is talking about situations during the Somoza dictatorship. Matagalpa, August 1971. Statement by the widow of Bernardino Diaz Ochoa, president of the Peasant General Workers Confederation who was murdered by the National Guard. The Peasant Federation was an uh, independent anti somoza uh, labor union. On 30 August 1971, this is a statement of his wife, my husband was dragged from our home in Latran Matagarpa in my present. They beat him and cut his ears and his tongue. I myself was beaten with clubs until I bled at the ears. The following day I saw my husband in the local jail. He had a blood-soaked handkerchief around his head but was conscious. The next day I was not permitted to see him. I was told that he was dead and that his body was too horrible to look at. He was buried by the National Guard. The next story, uh, the next story, the next uh, description of an atrocity given by the International Com uh, Commission of Jurists from their own uh, testimony is from a little town called Cerro Grande. Clementina Hernandez was raped and then atrociously assassinated by a National Guard patrol launching using high-caliber grenades. Eustachia Hernandez, 70 years of age, was also assassinated with Clementina Hernandez. Benigna Hernandez, another family member who had escaped, was later captured and tortured. A finger of her hand was cut off. Pedro Aguilar was brutally tortured, hanged from his thumbs, and beaten to unconscious. His eyes were punctured, and his penis was pierced with a hypodermic needle. He was able to escape, but having lost his eyesight, he was again captured and then assassinated. The final one of these stories for which I apologize, they're, they're true, but they're ferocious, is about the following. Quote, the Rio Blanco and Waslala concentration camps terrified the peasants. These were camps used by the National Guard to control the peasant areas. One saying became common, if taken to Rio Blanco, I will not come back. In this laboratory, crude torture was supplemented by scientific torture inflicted by United States, Brazilian, and Vietnamese advisors, such as Officer Lin Gay Ban. New recruits of the Guard watched these torture sessions and would later practice on prisoners. The Las Lala camp was more conventional. Prisoners were kept in mass latrines or immersed in mud holes. Men and women of all ages, including children, were kept in this camp. Now, if you're a poor person, or uh, if you're not a poor person but in the opposition, before the Sandinista Revolution, this is the kind of thing that you had to, you knew you were running the risk of this kind of thing, and now comes the story. The day after the triumph of the revolution, July 19th, 1979, 
the and and the day of and the day before, the Sandinista army arrested, made massive arrests of the National Guard who were still in the country. The vast majority of them were still in the country. Uh, 2,000 about had gotten out. They were arrested and put in private homes, mostly, the homes where rich people had fled, and they were put there, guards were surrounding them, the jails were full. It was a situation of tremendous confusion, but it was a very high priority to get them all arrested because of a human rights issue. And the human rights issue is, if they weren't arrested, they would be killed with the bare hands of the people. That was clear. And on one of these, on the day after, on July 20th, one of these houses became surrounded by a, a mob, a mob of people chanting to, for these young, the teenage Sandinista revolutionary soldiers to throw down their guns, just, just go away, take a powder for a half an hour, because we are going to take care of those people inside there. We know who they are. That one over there killed my mother. That one over there killed my son. That one over there tortured my wife. That one over there tortured me. And it got to be a very ugly scene. One of the young soldiers was able to get away to a uh, telephone, called the, uh, the the central operation, which at that, at that time, ironically, was no other place than the Intercontinental Hotel. That was the first seat of government for the revolutionary government in Managua. And from the Intercontinental Hotel, in an old broken down Jeep, came Tomas Borge. I don't know if you know who Tomas Borge is. Tomas Borge is the most red-baited man in all of Nicaragua. Uh, he is one of the nine commandantes of the revolution. He's the only one of the seven founders of the, of the Sandinista Front who uh, was not killed in the revolutionary. He's the only survivor. All of the other seven uh, died in, in combat. And uh, Tomas Borges is a, 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 an orator. He's a charismatic figure. He's, a, he's the oldest man by far on the on the junta and continually being accused of being the ultra, ultra, ultra left of the revolution. So for whatever that's where Tomas Borges is in his jeep speeding to these, this house and this is what happens when he gets there. When he gets there, he jumps up on the top of the beach, the, the jeep, and confronts this raging mob of people trying to break into this house with uh, uh, some questions. And his question is, what did they do to you? What did they do to your relatives? I want to hear every single terrible, horrible thing they did. And we're going to go one by one, and if it takes all day and all night, I'm not going to leave until I hear all the complaints. And so he started, and it went on for more than an hour. One by one, people saying, that one over there did this, that one over there did that. And we're going to kill them today, right now. And Tomas Borges, as the, as, the, as the time went on and people got, I don't know, they, they got something off their, off, their, off their chest, what the complaints were, he took a new tack and he said, do you want them to be punished? And everybody said, yes! And then he said, do you want to be, them to be punish, punished in the most severe way possible? And they said, yes, of course they would. And he said, do you want to be f them to be punished to the full and maximum possibility that punishment is allowed? And everybody said, yes. And then finally he said, do you want them to get every possible thing that they deserve by turning them over to me who will make sure they get everything they deserve? By that time, everybody said, yes. And after that, they couldn't changed their minds, and, and as a matter of fact, they went home, and nobody died in that house that day. Now, that is a rustic, uh, personal version of what, of what uh, the, the problem of human rights is in Nicaragua. For all the failings, 
that uh, Mr. Seaton talked about, there is a feeling that comes from the very top about respect for human rights. And that's just an example of it from the first day in an in a, in a absolutely life and death issue. And we'll come back to the, the press uh, issue in a couple of minutes. One of the things about human rights in Nicaragua that to me is really interesting is that human rights is defined there in a broader way than is usual. It is defined as a, a positive thing that you can fight for. Let me try to explain that more, more fully. Usually when we talk about human rights, what we mean are human rights defined as civil rights and political rights. That means that the type of thing, when you talk about human rights in normal discourse, the type of thing you're talking about is freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of religion, the right to a fair trial, uh, decent treatment if you're a prisoner, habeas corpus, things like that. That's, that's the usual concept. In Nicaragua, Nicaragua has accepted the definition of the United Nations, and as a matter of fact, they're the first country in Latin America who has a, a, a human rights commission, which is called the National Commission for the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights, which is a result of a mandate of the United Nations uh, uh, thinking on human rights. And that thinking include, expands human rights to include what are called economic and cultural rights. What that means is, it's in the most oversimplified terms, is that human rights includes, besides the sort of thing that concerns jail and, say, freedom of religion, that it also includes the right to a decent diet, to decent housing, economic human rights, and cultural human rights means it, it, the, the tools of, of education, the tools of thought, the tools of participating verbally in the political discourse. In Nicaragua, those are officially recognized. Uh, those, as well as the other, uh, the traditional definition of human rights, are, are um, defined as, as real human rights. Now, I'm going to tell you just a couple of minutes about those. In Nicaragua, how that broader definition of human rights is trying to be accomplished. One is uh, an educational campaign is going on. Expectations are being raised in the sense that, that, that uh, people are, are being told by the government that they have a right to an education, for example. The, the population of the university doubled in one year. It's causing a real problem just between you and me, the problem of getting good, decent teachers. And I mean, it's, it's a mess. The university is a mess, but it's, 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 uh, it's doubled its population and is groping around trying to find a way to deal with 30,000 students when last year it had 15,000 students. And uh, the reason is because the university is open, it is free for the first time to every, and it's open to every qualified uh, student who wants to go there in Nicaragua. So a, a little example, but I wanted to give you another example of the way the effort for economic um, human rights it works out in practice just the way I've seen it. In fact, it's affected my salary. I'll tell you how it affected my salary when I was there. One of the bright ideas that people had in the, in the uh, government, the revolutionary government in Nicaragua, was based upon a, a economic crunch. One, you cannot just give raises indiscriminately because all that does is cause inflation. We do not have any kind of a Soviet or Chinese model. A lot of people are worried about that. You hear it in the newspaper, the radio, the White House, the State Department. We don't have anything like a Soviet model of, uh, or a Chinese model where, where of controlled economy. Uh, it'd be nice if it were a little more controlled. It's a real wide open economy and it's a uh, mixed economy. It has a state sector, it has a capitalistic, uh, privately owned sector, 
and it works on kind of that dream, you know, the dream everybody has of what would happen if the United States just didn't have monopolies and if competition really worked. I mean, if we really had cars that competed like Burger King and McDonald's, you know, wouldn't that mean we'd have a better life? Wouldn't we have pro cars for $4,000 instead of $8,000? You, you know that argument. You've, you've heard that. Well, that kind of, that kind of, that kind of, uh, we have a market economy in Nicaragua. And you know what that means? That means if you go print money without having products to sell, you know this from Econ 1, what happens? The prices go up, inflation, just like that because there's the, the, it's not controlled, it's based upon a market. The only things that are controlled there are the absolute, like beans, rice, sugar, I think there's 18 things, the only things that are controlled. Everything else is... So, what does that mean about raises? No matter how poorly paid, and I was very poorly paid, $600 a month. I make $2,000 a month, which is very poorly paid for a university professor, but that's what I make back in California. And in Nicaragua, I make $600 a month, and I'm very well paid compared to other people in Nicaragua. That's neither here nor there. The idea is, what do you do with the question of a raise if you're a really revolutionary government that you can't because you want to have a free economy in that sense that I'm telling you about? You want to have a marketplace that really works, efficiency, healthy kind of competition, like, you know, the small shop owners producing better services, better on time, cheaper prices. If you want that, then... You can't just give everybody raises indiscriminately. So what do you do? This is what they did. They figured out that in the state sector, to keep up with inflation, you needed to have a raise of about 12% that the previous year. This year because of, well, there's a whole lot of reasons. That, that the inflation is 20%, which is still low for, for Latin America, but higher than was hoped for. So the raises this year are 20%. The raises last year when I was there were 12%. Now, how, how did they do that? The way they did it, to not put too much money into the system, but to go in the direction of the economic human right of the poorest of the poor, having enough to buy decent food for themselves, take their child to whatever is needed, to have proper clothes, etc., decent clothes. The answer was, they gave the raise, if you can imagine this, they took, say that everybody in where I worked, they add up all the salaries together, took 12% of that, and said, that's the total pot for the raise. That's clear. And then, say that where I worked, there were 100 people working there. They took the total pot, divided it by 100, and gave that much of a raise to everybody. Do you see how that, do you see what happens then? Then the poorest person in there who's making $100 a month, I think it actually worked out. That person got a raise of something like $48 a month. They, all, they, all, they got a 50% increase at my elevated uh, uh, income range, the top range there is $1,000. The head of state gets $1,000 a month. Uh, the heads of state. There's lots of heads of state in Nicaragua. It is run by committees. Um, I got $42, and that amounted to what? A lot less than, than uh, 12%. So I got less, they got more. So, and, and I wasn't unhappy with that because I could see the fairness of it. I could see the suffering of the, of the uh, poorest people, the people like the janitors who are working in, in the institution, the Ministry of Education where I worked. And it's, 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 it, I know it's just a tiny little thing, but it's an illustration of the, of the concern. That's really what I'm trying to get at. The idea of Tomas Borges, I'll never forget that, uh, running out there on a jeep and jumping up on the, on the hood that kind of attitude, even though it gets, pardon the expression, screwed up sometimes, is the basic effort that is going on all the time with respect to human rights at all those different levels in Nicaragua. Now, what about cultural human rights? Which, 
pretty much, uh, there's lots of definition of cultural human rights, but one of the important things is, is education. And the, uh, Mr. Seaton uh, did a very nice job of giving a summary of, of, of education. I'll just give you a few other statistics about the program that I was involved in, which, which was the major program of the first year of the revolution. That is to say, the, the 1980 was called the Year of Literacy, just as this year is called the Year of Defense and Production even at the beginning of the year the need for defense was clear we're going to go into that a little bit more too what was the task of literacy in of illiteracy I guess you would say in Nicaragua the rate of illiteracy under the Somoza regime was almost exactly 50 percent it was 50.2 percent and that's not including everybody, that's just adults. We defined adults as, as people 10 years and older because once you were 10 years old in, in, in Nicaragua and did not know how to read and write, um, that was it. In other words, this, the way things work there, there is no second chance. Nobody goes back to grammar school at 10 years old. So, so from there on, you, you're not, never going to learn to read unless you're in a special program. So 50% of that age group did not know how to read and write. We're illiterate. A program was uh, dreamt up. I was one of the people allowed to work on it. And uh, by the time the program was over, in August of 1980, it was very short and very fast, uh, the literacy rate had been reduced to 12.96%, really 13%, let's call that. And uh, this little country with, with zero resources, a destroyed economy, uh, had produced um, 450,000 new readers, had trained 7,000 new teachers to teach people how to, to read and write, and to teach the, teach the ones who actually taught, 7,000 teachers of teachers, and had trained over 100,000 actual teachers, high school youth, just citizens in general, who are willing to do the job of volunteering and being a literacy teacher. So even though it's a kind of unspectacular form or manner of looking at human rights, it's part of what Nicaragua, in its own view of human rights, views as, um, as their effort of us doing, us meaning them, of them doing the best they can to uh, fulfill the promises of respecting human rights. Now, let's talk about some of the horror stories. Some of the things that, that, um, one of the things in, in the traditional human rights area which is uh, extremely important. I mean, I would never live in any country where this didn't really work, is the right of habeas corpus. Basically, that means if the police pick you up, they can't hide you. They got to they gotta, they gotta let people know where you are. On demand sometimes, but at least on demand, they got to let people know you, where you are and let your lawyer talk to you. That's what habeas corpus means. Now, the extreme opposite end, or the, they say the extreme opposite of respect for habeas corpus, which goes through the no, no habeas corpus problem of you get arrested and, and, and nobody will admit it, the extreme opposite, which goes through that middle area, is one of the most common and, 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 and sickening, horrible things that happens in most of the countries in Latin America still, doesn't happen in Nicaragua, which is the phenomenon of desaparecidos. Desaparecido is a Spanish word which means the disappeared ones, the ones who are disappeared. You, you, if you translate it literally, it comes out like the people who have been disappeared 
are the desaparecidos. In proper English, I would say, you probably translate it, that the people who have been made to disappear. Those people are the people who have been arrested a very, very, very small minority are hidden away in jails and the phenomenon of the desaparecidos is that the rest are murdered by the police and the bodies are either hidden or abandoned in a place not near the police station. That's the phenomenon of the desaparecidos. Now, um, the extreme opposite of habeas corpus. So I'm kind of just doing free association to that. But I did want to mention one thing about the, uh, what was mentioned about Jose Esteban Gonzalez, the human rights person who was put in jail. That doesn't sound very good for government, does it? To put somebody from a human rights commission in jail for talking about human rights. He was put in jail for talking about human rights to none less than the Pope. That's a fact. That is indefensible, right? Well, I'm not going to try to defend it. I'm just going to tell you what he said. He said that Nicaragua had 600 desaparecidos. That's what he said. And he said, here are the names. And there's 600 names. What do you conclude from that? I know what I would conclude from that if I were the Pope. I would conclude that the Sandinista government is a murderous, assassinating government, no different from the murderous, assassinating governments of El Salvador, Guatemala, Argentina, Uruguay, the other countries that are receiving all-out aid from the United States to keep those governments in power. I'm going to get to that later, too. That was really gratuitous. I subtract that last one. That was too close to sarcasm. The point I'm trying to get at is, what would you, what would you think if you were the Pope? And somebody said, look at those names! Do you know who those 600 desaparecidos were? 598 of those desaparecidos were desaparecido by Somoza. They haven't shown up yet. They never will show up. But what is the impression that a human rights person gives when they say, look, here's this list, this is outrageous. The implication was a lie. And the lie was that they had been desaparecido by the present government in Nicaragua. To put it mildly, when Jose Esteban Gonzalez came back to Nicaragua, they saw red. Pardon that color. Shouldn't have said that. Uh, they were angry, very angry. Some people that I know in the, in, the, in the government thought that the decision to put him in jail, they put him in jail for about a week, then he was out. And he doesn't have to leave the country, he's just out. They thought that was a bad decision. It's one of those things. I think it was a bad decision, just between you and me too. But it's not the same thing as putting a person in jail for telling the truth. That was my only, that's the point I want to make. There are two. Uh, 598, 600 minus 598 are two. Two have disappeared since the beginning of the, since the revolution, since July 19th. Just two. That's all they can find. And believe me, the Sandinista government would like to know as much as any human rights organization, what happened to those two? They suspect that they were probably murdered by Sandinista soldiers out of revenge or out of 
going berserk, or who knows why. But they are totally and absolutely opposed to that kind of behavior. And if they found that this has happened, Sandinista soldiers have committed murder. They're no saints. Murders of passion. The, the trials are short and swift. They become ex-Sandinista soldiers within one second. And in the, the case that I'm thinking of, one of them killed a businessman. To, it was robbery, armed robbery. But he was a Sandinista soldier who did it. It was armed robbery. He got the maximum sentence. He got the maximum sentence from the beginning to end. The whole thing took about two weeks for the trial and the witnesses and the judge to make the decision. So they do not fool around and tortured his wife, the first story. Those people really exist. They're in jail in Nicaragua right now. What did the government do with them? What was their approach? In what way did, with respect to this, which is, it's not just the enemy. I don't know where the enemy is, but it's this, it's like a real personal um, thing to have to deal with people who've done that to you and, and, and yours. Here's some facts. One of the very first things that Nicaragua did under the Sandinista government was stop the death penalty. There is nothing, nothing in the world that you can do, no matter how horrible it is, that can get you more than a 30-year sentence. Not that that's particularly short. But murder, treason, I don't know what it is. 30 years, there is no death penalty. And there's no life sentence either. It's 30 years maximum. There were about 7,000 of these uh, prisoners who you could call them captured, but basically they were rescued from being murdered by the crowds on the Day of Liberation. After things calmed down for a while, about 2,000 were let go on pardons. About 2,000 more have gotten out of jail because they are judged innocent. Not every National Guard person is a criminal. Just by being in the National Guard, you are not considered a criminal. So some of them were judged that they just never participated in any of the atrocities, and they were let go. A large number were judged guilty, but guilty of minor things, and given sentences less than two years. And the two years is coming up, the time from the July 19th on. So even though the process of judging and all that, and you finally get a sentence, and it's two years, you might be just a month away from getting out of, out of jail. For Easter, it's kind of funny, the, uh, such a, a really religious country, Nicaragua. The, 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 the previous bunch got out on Christmas time. No, it was last Easter. No, it was before Christmas. Uh, uh, a popular festival around December 8th uh, to the Virgin. And uh, they, it's pretty much like an open secret that uh, about a thousand more will be let out of jail on pardon. They're guilty, but the basic thing is their re re rehabilitation is possible. These are the people who, who seem to be willing to, 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 I don't know what you'll call it. Right? We call it going straight. They seem to be uh, people who were not the actual uh, torturers and murderers and uh, so they're getting out apparently uh, this coming East in a couple of weeks now. During those first couple of days because of Tomas Borque, other comandantes and because of just ironclad rule that none of those guards are going to die, the concern for them, there is a grand total of seven. Seven National Guards were lynched. In other words, th that's seven too many, right? But it is a very, very small number compared to what would have happened if a real decision had not been made to try to save their lives. With respect to uh, torture, torture is a big issue. Am I going to stand here and tell you that there has been no torture in Nicaragua since the Sandinista revolution came in. No, I'm not, because there has been. I know of a case myself of a person who was tortured by having cigarettes 
uh, held against the bottom of his feet. Isn't that a shocker, given where you know I'm coming from? It's a fact. You can't deny it. Who were the torturers? The torturers were Sandinista police. What happened to the torturers? The torturers were fired, then judged, and then put in jail for torturing. Do you remember what Paulo Freire said? One of the most, uh, Paulo, the famous Brazilian educator. One of the most amazing, one of the most true things I think Paulo Freire ever said, wrote in Pedagogy Depressed, was the section where he said, the oppressed, because they know no other model except the model of the oppressor, will frequently, in a moment of liberation, take it upon themselves to become the oppressor because it's the only kind of liberation they've ever seen. The only free people they've ever seen, quote, free people they have ever seen have been the oppressor. So when they get a chance, they become the oppressor. But people like the leadership of the Sandinista revolution are far beyond that. And some poor, misguided people have done that. And uh, just to give you a statistic, I can give you an actual statistic if you want it. In the police force alone, to say nothing of the army, there have been 2,000 people fired since the beginning in less than two years. And they've all been fired for lack of discipline, for, for, for not acting like revolutionary policemen should. Respecting what that boils down to is they've been fired for not respecting human rights of the other citizens. About the freedom of the press, I believe that um, the situation about freedom of the press there is very tense. On the one hand, you have a, f a, a, a fierce opposition paper called La Prensa, which is very, very strong in its opposition. You have a government paper called Barricada, which is kind of triumphalistic, shows the good side of everything. And you have another independent paper called El Nuevo Diario, which is sympathetic to the government, to the Sandinista revolution, rather than to the opposition. So, the, especially with the two, the Nuevo Diario and the Prensa, there is kind of a model situation of, 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 of pluralism. And it's just stinging, stinging, uh, seems to me that it would be almost libelous, I think, from both sides going back and forth, with high level, high voltage, shouting at each other from different sides of the, of the political points of view. But once again, I would like to plant a, a question with you based upon a fact. In Nicaragua, like any country, and especially any Latin or any country, has a group of people who, in the revolutionary process, in the post-revolutionary process, are losing power. They're losing ground with respect to the ability to control, to command. That group is the group of big business and the rich. The Nicaraguan government's position is that big business and the rich are welcome to stay big business and to stay rich but not to have power to run things the way they want to run things. In other words, there's no problem with ownership or with owning factories or whatever it is, keeping going at that level. But there is, there is, and, and people are feeling that. People from the upper class are feeling that. One of the results of them feeling that is a division with respect to what to do about it. And there's three basic sides if you want to call it that. Three basic tendencies in Nicaragua, in the upper class, the rich class. And the three basic tendencies are just kind of what you would expect. One is the group like the cotton farmers. The cotton farmers are kind of the heroes of, 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 of that class from, from my point of view because the cotton farmers 
have, obviously, because they're doing a magnificent job of growing cotton, have decided that even though they don't, they don't like it, and that they're not going to have any real power in this government any more than a regular citizen would have, they're not going to have extra power just because they're rich, that cotton farmer is still growing cotton and seems to be uh, just going along with it, even though he or she probably doesn't like it. Then there is a middle group who's a wait and see group, see what's going to, what way is the wind going to blow. And then there is a group that has become really counter-revolutionary. There's a group inside the country who can't stand the idea of that power being spread out among the people and who is overtly <laughs> getting ready to do something about it. And the problem of the, the press, or the problem of the government, is the moment that the press becomes part of that subversion of the whole hope for a new kind of government in Nicaragua, what do you do? And they have a real quandary, and they're trying to work that through. One of the things that has, ha that has happened that, that, that me, with my kind of consciousness anyway, good old USA, California, do your thing consciousness that I have, um, one of the most really interesting things that has, ha that has happened is, well, let me tell you something. We're, Nicaragua is in a terrific economic crisis. As much as Nicaragua would like to be independent of the United States and is politically independent, it's not a, a toady like it was under Somoza. The United States is able to put incredible economic pressure on, on Nicaragua, and it's doing it. It's not just cutting off foreign aid, but it's, but it's making sure that loans are more difficult to get, that, that sort of thing. Economic harassment is going on right now. And there is a real economic crisis because of that, because and, and another thing was just like, I guess you could call it bad luck, a terrible, rotten, unbelievably miserable bean crop. No beans. It's a country that runs on beans and rice. And there's no beans. So you've got to have money to buy beans, and the loan is... You get the picture. There is a real crisis going on. What has the Sandinista government decided to do about that crisis? What would you expect them to do if they really were what they're falsely accused of being, which is the Soviet model in Latin America? They would put the screws on, man. That's what they would do. There'd be no more prensa. There'd be no more opposition newspaper. There'd be a tremendous campaign saying, work harder for the glory of the revolution or something like that. That's not what's going on at all in Nicaragua right now. What's going on in Nicaragua right now is a convocation of all the political parties, of all the interested groups, to start a national dialogue to figure out what to do about this crisis because the leadership fundamentally isn't sure. It, it's like an impossible thing. It's so complex. But that what I'm talking about, with at least, you know, where my sensibilities are, the idea of when you, when you feel lost, of opening up rather than clamping down, is a very good sign for the future of Nicaragua. And now, to conclude, I would like to contrast what I've just said about Nicaragua with a country which is also accused of human rights violation, violations. And that is the only other country in Central America I know anything about, which is El Salvador. And I'd like to start out by reading you a couple of sentences from an article by Jorge Pinto. Jorge Pinto is a newspaper man. He's a newspaper owner and editor, or he was, in the city of San Salvador. And this is what he writes. On January 16th, he's talking about this year, as editor and publisher of El Independiente in San Salvador, I was to write, wire an article that the Los Angeles Times had requested 
giving my views of the events in El Salvador. First, I had a telephone conversation with an editor at the Times. An hour later, the military came looking for me at the nearby office of the Independent Associated Press, of which I'm also the director, and arrested the staff. My newspaper again established phone, con phone contact with Los Angeles to report that the article could not be transmitted because the building was being surrounded by troops. Simultaneously, the military went to my home and threatened my wife and three-year-old son with death. Later, we gathered at a friend's home. Meanwhile, troops returned in force to my newspaper and smashed all the equipment. Learning that the military wanted me dead or alive, I took my family to the Mexican embassy where we were granted political asylum. Now, I find myself in exile in Mexico. Freedom of the press in El Salvador. Personal story number two, with respect to treatment of war prisoners, of people involved in war on the opposite side. I know a Salvadorian priest who can't be in Salvador because if he were, he would be killed on sight by any government soldier who recognized him. I won't use his real name. He's working in the revolution still. And we'll call him Father Bruno. About six months ago, Father Bruno, who was in the country, in San Salvador, still acting as a priest, was believed by the National Guard of El Salvador to be at home with his parents. He was from a campesino family. He was from a poor family in the countryside. The police went to his house. This is the police, the, the National Guard. Surrounded his house. The, the, the forces of law and order in El Salvador. They surrounded his house. And when they had, it's actually two houses. Uh, an uncle's house and his father and mother's house that were all together. Just, it's bamboo and thatched roof open-air kind of house together. Had everybody at gunpoint, two soldiers went in to both of the front doorways with machine guns in their hands and started to shoot. Their intention was to murder Father Bruno. By some miracle, maybe this is what they mean by a miracle in in religion. Father Bruno was not there. But that night, his mother, his father, four nieces, his aunt, his uncle, and whatever it makes up, 12 other people, not 12 other people, a total of 12 people died, including the four children. Machine gun to death on the floor of, the, of that house. the um, human rights story of El Salvador. The last one, uh, th there's no way you can end gracefully with this kind of stories I started in, and ended with. But the last one is the story of a Honduran priest I know. Honduran priests are, <laughs> they have, well, it's a tough life to be a Honduran priest right now on the border with Salvador because of who they are, because of what they want to do to help the people who are the refugees coming across. This is the story, let's call him Father Rafael. Perhaps some of you, to give you a little background, have heard the story of Sampul, Rio Sampul. I understand, as opposed to the speaker last week, who said that he could never pin down anything that happened at Rio Sampul with any kind of real 
clarity. I know one of the priests who was the witness of Rio Sampul, a Honduran priest. The story of Rio Sampul is the story of a military operation in which the Honduran army, which has given instructions to collaborate with the Salvadorian army, provides a sandwich kind of an operation as refugees cross from El Salvador into Honduras to escape from the, uh, basically it's from the napalming, the indiscriminate napalming of civilian population in the border areas, in the parts that the, if you want to call it that way, the liberated areas of El Salvador. And Father Rafael was, oh, and what happened at San Pool is that the people people don't even know it's like a me like kind of a thing the, the, the order the instructions of the Honduran army was just to keep those people back and to not let them cross and to then keep them there so that the airplanes would come in and get them from the air the, the El Salvador in other words their hands would be free it would be clean but as a matter of fact they went berserk and according to the witnesses who were there their estimate is that in a, about a five hour period 400 women, children, and old people were killed in that river trying to get across by the Hondurans themselves. Now, there was a massive migration coming across about two weeks ago. The situation is very rough there because of, of, of this new technique that they have of napalming. 7,000, which is an immense number of, of people to, to deal with as refugees, 7,000 people were going to cross that river in one day. Word had been sent that the only chance we have of making it with, without a huge massacre again, like Sampul, is if the religious show up and the relief workers, the, the Mennonites were tremendous. The Mennonites went there, risked their lives. All the people involved in relief on the Honduran side went down there just to be witnesses, just to stand there, just to make it hard to have another massacre because of so many witnesses to see it if it happened. And one of those people who went was Father Rafael. And he was walking along the road on the Honduran side feeling you know, a little dangerous, but what could happen to me? And in the far, far distance was heard the, the motor, a sound of, a, of, a, of, a, of an airplane. And he, he, he was, what is that? And he heard a little bit, and he looked around. When he heard, that's an airplane, he looked around to see what it was. Indeed, it was an airplane. He looked back, and he was all by himself. He had been surrounded with a group of 30 women and children and old men. In a period of two seconds, he was standing all by himself on the road, and the tracer bullet started to go right by him. Brrr. He, he, I don't know why, these details a person remembers. He jumped to his left as fast as he could. He went over the side of the road, he went down into a mud puddle, face down, got himself up on an elbow and looked back like that and saw three old ladies beckoning him, get out quick, get out quick, who had heard the motor, who are so accustomed to this sort of thing, had heard the motor and had gotten under a rock on the side of the road, just boom like that, without so fast that they didn't have time to tell him. That day, because of the presence of the of the of the uh, the internet, the people like the Mennonites and the nurses and the doctors and the priests and the nuns, seven of those poor people were killed, which is a lot, but much less than would have been killed otherwise. And very few were were got hit by the strafing airplanes because of the fact that they were so fast. They got down under the underbrush and they they just disappeared as far as the airplanes were concerned. And just to add one little, what I think is a, a awful thing about the so-called restraints of, of war, 
that Salvadorian airplane being advised by U.S. advisors on how to work, probably not to do what he did, but he was strafing on the Honduran side. And he was not strafing on the Salvadorian side. He was strafing on the Honduran side, trying to kill women and children who were sympathetic. There's no question about that those people are sympathetic to the revolution. The reason they don't have any men is because their men are fighting. But, it, but is that a reason to kill them from an airplane or from anywhere else? My final example of an alternative vision of non-human rights in a neighboring country to um, Nicaragua. And I, I kind of, I'd like to end with a, another question that's admittedly a rhetorical question, but it's the question that bothers me the most as a citizen of this country who loves this country and is coming back to live in this country in three more months. And that is, why are we doing everything we can to destabilize the Nicaraguan government, who in its imperfect sort of a way is struggling to have a decent life for its people and a good record on human rights? And why do we support a government like the present government of El Salvador, which uh, systematically kills its enemies. There's no trials, there's no nothing. You're just... As Ed said, I don't remember what his phrase was. He called it, I think, the Argentinian model. Why do we support a country where the opposition is not dialogued with, as it is in Nicaragua, but systematically killed? Thank you very much.